I want to just share a brief quote with you from uh, Arundhati Roy, the Indian author. Um, she's going to publish a new book, Freedom, Fascism, and Fiction, later this year. But this is an essay that um, she read live. What is this thing that has happened to us? It's a virus, yes. In and of itself, it holds no moral brief. But it is definitely more than a virus. It has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. I suspect most of you that have been listening for a while know that I consume way too much news. I'm honestly trying to cut back. But the only TV news I get is early in the morning, I wake up and watch Morning Joe while I have my coffee. There are times when they have really good guests, when there is uh, a informative conversation going on. But you have to know, if you're going to watch Morning Joe, you will be regularly treated to moments when you are just overhearing a small group of millionaires stroking their own egos before a live television audience. It seems to happen the most often when the host, Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski, are joined by their friend and advertising tycoon, Donny Deutsch as if they were perched literally on bags of money. They presumed to give the Democratic Party advice about their branding, their marketing profile, their appeal to voters. On Monday, the trio confidently assured one another that Americans are, at best, a little right of center. They are turned off by the social reconstruction proposed in Biden's infrastructure and reconciliation bills. Deutsch always likes to throw in the scare word socialism so that Democrats will know that if they keep acting like socialists, that they will lose every election, in spite of the fact that they seem to have been winning a lot of elections lately. What frightens these very wealthy people as they pretend to be journalists with their fingers on the pulse of the American voter can be summed up in a three-word phrase so succinct that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez could wear it on the back of a formal gown. Tax the rich. The tax burden in America has left the very wealthy paying a much smaller percentage of their income in taxes than those of us with uh, much more modest middle-class incomes. Tax cuts on high-income earners from the Reagan era in the 80s all of the way through Trump's very generous and unnecessary tax cut for the rich is why that our government cannot afford to provide the social services provided to citizens of most of Western Europe. Well, tax cuts and, and an obviously bloated military budget don't get me started. But what is frightening about this socialism that Joe, Mika, and Donnie want to protect us all from. What is actually in Biden's socialist reconstruction infrastructure and reconciliation bills? Now, I don't want to get lost in the weeds about the difference between the two. They're both huge spending bills, but, you know, beyond repairing roads, bridges, power lines, and water systems, and some of the social infrastructure with things like broadband, uh, internet access, most of which is in reconciliation. But I do want to point out that as the media keeps using these large dollar figures like $3 trillion or $3.5 trillion to make it seem like we're anticipating a communist revolution, folks, we spent more than that on wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so far as I can see, we got nothing for our money other than unnecessary deaths and a tremendous loss of American credibility. But if, rather than wasting our resources on endless and admittedly illegal wars, 
what if we spend American resources on Americans? What do we get? Beyond long-delayed and much-needed repairs to roads, bridges, and the power grid and water systems, it's proposed that we strengthen families by providing universal pre-K classes and affordable child care, which would allow more American workers to actually go back to work. And it helps to give the children of the working class a better start in education. It's also proposed that there be a continuation of the child tax credit that has already reduced the number of children living in poverty by more than 50%. So we want to keep doing that, right? Frankly, I know of many families that have not had children because they keep saying they're waiting until they can afford it. We're not even replacing existing labor force in the United States because our birth rate is so low. This tax credit would make it possible for both the wealthy and the poor to have a family. And it also provides for 12 weeks of paid family leave in the case of a new birth, adoption, or a serious family illness. It would not surprise you to know, to know that in spite of what Joe Meek and Donnie say, most American voters love these ideas. These are, after all, programs that are already present in most of the developed world. Only in the richest country in the world are these services not provided. And it proposes to make two years of community college education uh, tuition free. Now, two years is not the same thing as a four-year degree. And in a real democracy, the children of the poor should have the same access to the same quality of education as the children of the wealthy. But no one is even proposing free college at the best college that you're smart enough to get into. But two years of community college is better than nothing at all. And those who do well in a community college often find the way to go on to a state university or a private college for a full four-year degree. This is not a substantive solution to how to close the income gap that is largely driven by access to education, but it's a step in the right direction, and it is a step supported by most American voters. And while this proposal falls far short of providing <clears throat> the universal health care that I've been talking about for the last 15 years, um, the kind of universal health care that is provided in most of the developed nations of the world, it does provide for expanding Medicare and Medicaid to cover millions of people who are not now covered, something that wins approval from almost everyone except for the very wealthy. And as I'm sure you've all seen the ads on TV that the pharmaceutical companies are paying, as uh, Bernie Sanders says, millions and millions of dollars to run, it should not surprise you to know that they are lying to you again. What is being proposed is that we allow Medicare, the largest purchaser of prescription medications in the world, to take competitive bids for these prescription meds because we in the USA pay generally about two and a half times as much for these medications as they do in other countries. The pharmaceutical giants do not want to end this enormous government giveaway to already very profitable corporations. But do you know who does want to end this obscenity? People on Medicare that are having to pay exorbitant prices for their medication. People like the majority of American voters. In these proposed bills, there's also substantial investment in affordable housing, both to repair decaying homes and to make it more possible for first-time home buyers to get into a home of their own, something that's long overdue and something that would also be applauded by a majority of voters. Now, what's not in these bills is the Green New Deal that many of us had hoped for, but there is some money for improving rail service and also subsidies for buying electrical vehicles and even more subsidies for people who buy EVs that are manufactured in America. I got to tell you, 
American laborers love this idea. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, a coal millionaire himself, has made certain that the renewable energy portions of this bill have already been gutted. So this is not a panacea, but it is a positive start. The coal industry is on its way out anyway, whether the government continues to step in and hasten their demise or whether everyone just realized it's not just the dirtiest way to generate energy, it's also quickly becoming the most expensive. These proposals, as I've said, fall far short of the ideal of really trying to bring Western European-style social democracy to the USA, but it's so much more than I ever dreamed we would see out of a Joe Biden administration. Biden was never a progressive, and for much of his career, the reason that he could work across the aisle and, and work with Republicans was because you couldn't tell much difference between Joe Biden and a Republican. Biden, however, is an ardent Catholic, though he never sounded much like Mother Teresa or Daniel Berrigan or Thomas Merton or Dorothy Day. Somehow, though, we are seeing a different Joe Biden in this current debate, we are seeing someone whose political agenda does seem to bear the fingerprints of the Christian social values that most of us have loved for years. What has made the difference? Why now is Joe Biden coming out of the closet as a real progressive? <clears throat> With your permission, I will speculate that at least a large part of what's made the difference is the pandemic itself. Not just 700,000 deaths, as horrible as that has been, but the massive disruption of the economy. Restaurants have closed, bookstores, dress shops that were reduced to curb service rather than letting people come in and browse have gone out of business. The pandemic has required relief checks and stimulus checks, government spending at an unprecedented level when you're not involved in a world war. They even gave payroll protection grants to churches, thank God, because that's how I got paid for a lot of last year. The pandemic has been, number one, a health disaster, but secondly, it's been an economic disaster, and the government has stepped in to prevent it from causing a massive depression. We've spent money in the past 18 months that we never would have spent had we not been in the middle of a crisis, and that includes the Trump administration. It had to be done. It's like when a powerful hurricane hits several miles of very valuable beachfront property. It's a huge economic and often human loss when this happens, but the other thing that happens is that old, poorly built or poorly maintained buildings fall down. Badly planned development with, with hotels uh, too close to the water's edge all get wiped out. And when the water subsides and the debris is removed, communities then have the opportunity to build back in smarter, more eco-friendly ways. If I may be allowed to say it this way, they get a chance to build back better. <laughs> major natural disasters, as well as human-caused disasters like a major war or a mass migration, can change the face of society in ways that keep it from just snapping back into what they had called normal before. And I love the way that Roy writes about it in this brilliant essay, uh, which I quoted earlier, but a further quote, she says, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. This is a portal. It's a gateway between one world and the one we've been waiting for. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through this portal lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Our millionaire friends on the sets of morning news talk shows are trying to shutter our imaginations, limit our options, 
by trying to make the price tag sound almost comical. $3.5 trillion, without mentioning that this is a 10-year program. So simple math shows it's more like a $250 billion or $350 billion a year program. What's more, in the midst of this crisis, the most wealthy Americans, the super rich, our billionaires who are shooting themselves into the sky for very expensive five and six minute long joy rides, they have become 60% richer during the pandemic. They have exploited the government spending and business panics to pocket nearly $2 trillion just in the last year. So just a flat 15 or 20% tax on these obscene profits would pay for uh, every program that I mentioned that are in these bills. Mark Zuckerberg has become 137% richer in the last year. What if he had only doubled his immense fortune and had to pay some taxes with the rest of it? Do you think he would be cutting coupons out of the Sunday paper to, to buy his pizzas? Now, most of us grew up playing this board game, Monopoly, where three or four players start out with a certain amount of money, and then they roll the dice to see which properties or utilities their playing piece lands on. If you've got the money, you can buy available properties, make improvements on it, and then charge the other players rent when they happen to land on your property. Predictive skills, some strategy helps in this game, but mostly it's the roll of the dice. Eventually, one player gets all the land and all the money, and everyone else is broke. What you may not know about this game is that it was invented near the end of the 19th century by a very clever woman named Lizzie Maggie, and she invented it as a teaching tool about the downsides of a purely capitalist economic system, which allows people to hoard so much wealth that nobody else has anything. She told a reporter in 1906, in a short time, I hope in a very short time, men and women will discover that they are poor because Carnegie and Rockefeller have more than they know what to do with. The myth that the super wealthy want to uh, sell to the rest of us is that they are just so smart. They are so talented. They are so hardworking that they earned these huge fortune, fortunes and that they deserve this disproportionate ability to hoard the country's resources. And some of them say that even if they just inherited all that money from maybe daddy Sam Walton, but they still think they deserve it. It's a myth that is based just a little bit on truth, but their wealth, really like a monopoly game, depends in part on their ability to throw the dice well. It depends a whole lot more on chance. Being in the right place at the right time to ride the wave of changes in the economy to end up with literally a mountain of money. The billionaires of America, and mind you, a billion dollars is a thousand million dollars, but the most wealthy have hoarded not a billion dollars, but some of them more than a hundred billion dollars. Just the top 10 list of this club of billionaires are collectively holding more than a trillion dollars in assets, which makes the Carnegies and the Rockefellers look a little bit like paupers. Why don't we have universal health care in America? Why don't we have paid leave for new parents, tuition-free education for students, and more investment in renewable energy? It is specifically because a tiny club of businessmen have been allowed to hoard way too much of the nation's resources. We know that income and wealth disparity will destroy the capitalist systems of Western nations. Not maybe, will destroy it. We know that we have to fix it. We have to correct it or there will be a total economic collapse globally. 
We also know that we need to take drastic measures to save our planet's ecology, but it never seems like a good time to do either one. It seems to be impossible to muster the moral will to do what needs to be done. However, in a pandemic, when money is moving at this scale, that is exactly when we can best afford to make changes in our social structure that we preachers have been talking about for decades, but we always sound like we're just pie-in-the-sky idealists. But now, now we really could do it. If we simply strive to return to normal, a normal defined by the violence of poverty, crime, homelessness, illness, that would be a failure of government. It would be a failure of public morality, and sadly, it would be a failure of preachers. And I don't want to fail, and I hope you don't want me to either. Imagine a new and better world that is better than normal better than the way things were, and never stop fighting until we have succeeded in making the world the better world that we've been talking about for 3,000 years. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.